Welcome to Moss Marketing Monday, a.k.a. the M3 Podcast. Brought to you by Moss Marketing Group. Bringing you everything marketing every Monday. Stay tuned for marketing tips and tricks you can use today. The M3 Podcast, marketing knowledge to help you succeed. Let's get started. Welcome back to the M3 Podcast. This week, we got Stephen McBee on with us. We got Dre from the MMG crew, Ricky from the MMG crew. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. It's been fun so far. I'm looking forward to this. I know. We've been hanging around the house. We should have been podcasting for the last two hours, <laughs> but a uh, lot, lot going on. And life is very, very full for you right now. It's been busy. It's, it's been a lot of fun, but I've enjoyed the, in, enjoyed the ride so far. So uh, just recently... Well, in this era, it'll be two weeks, but uh, just recently dropped the McBee Dynasty on Peacock. That's pretty cool. And I feel like that's a pretty big achievement. I don't know about much of an achievement. I, I keep getting called. <laughs> we, they keep saying reality star Stephen McBee. And I'm, there, there's no star involved here. Basically, <laughs> we're just a big shit show. And that's why we were put on TV. Other than that, there's no talent or anything. <laughs> uh, I think it's pretty damn cool to have a TV show about your guys' family, about the just everything that takes place there. Uh, you guys have a huge operation mm -hmm. and I do want to dive in into that story a little bit. And I think we've talked a lot about the TV show being filmed and just how much went into it. And that was something that we had no earthly idea about. It's and a full on job while you're filming. I mean, it's, you know, obviously it's an honor and it's a, an extreme blessing to even have the opportunity to do that but it is a lot of work and to try and juggle that along with real life business and in real life obviously relationships it's a it's a challenge <laughs> so in the show when it starts off in the beginning it talks about your family coming up and it talks mm -hmm. your, your dad's talking about coming from this grassroots area not having money being poor and i feel like the show kind of skipped over that that early on story so i want to back up in the beginning and, and set that early tone of like what did it look like what because it wasn't like you guys were super little. No. Like no, you guys experienced that like coming up. We did. Yeah. So uh, my dad has always had that same personality. He doesn't know a stranger and he's not um, one to fear anything. So he's a risk taker more than anyone I've ever seen in my entire life. And uh, he was like that from an early age. So at 21, right when I was first born, he started a telecommunications company that had been 1994. Um, did very well with that telecommunications company and ended up buying his first farm in 1998. It was a 300 acre track up by Gallatin, just bought it for hunting and fishing. Um, so we've always loved the outdoors. He's always loved the outdoors. And whenever he had a little bit of money, that was the first thing he wanted to do was buy that farm so we could go up there on the weekends and hunt and fish. Uh, we'd go up there and around all the ponds, there'd be beer cans. There would be random people up there and we're like, who the hell is letting you on this piece of ground? And they're like, well, the farmer is. We leased it out to a local farmer. And so we are like, okay, that's got to stop her. I was, shoot, four or five years old at the time. So my dad was like, okay, that's got to stop. So he kicked the farmer off and he's like, we'll just do it ourselves. And so he bought an old John Deere used tractor for $20,000, $25,000. And the setups required like very low level farming um, and tried to learn how to farm. And for a first generation farmer, like, Farming seems so simple. You just stick seed in the ground, it rains and it grows. It couldn't be further from the <laughs> truth. Like, there, there's so much that goes into farming. And so from 2005 would have been the first year he actually tried it his first year farming. We did like 100 acres, um, just failing, learning, failing, learning, failing, learning. Um, and, and throughout that time, he still had the telecommunications company. We were blue collar, still are blue collar, but he was still... Uh, you know, good money, but not great money. We lived in a very average house. Our farmhouse had holes in the floor. We'd go up there, sleep on cots. And like I told you earlier, there'd be mice running along the floor at night and we'd shoot them with BB guns. That's what we did for fun. <laughs> like it was very, very low level. Um, and then in uh, 2008, whenever the real estate market crashed, he was starting to buy residential real estate. So he got into the real estate market, was buying these properties for no money down. At that time, the banks were like, please take this property, like this troubled asset. We don't want anything to do with it. We're writing it off our loan book, like just take it, no money down. So he started buying all of these properties. Well, 10 years later, 2018, those same properties that he was buying for 20 and $30,000 a door were 
flipping for 120K a door. So that's what really exponentially grew the farm. And that was 2018, so what, seven, six, seven years ago? Um, and so that was really where all of the businesses started to take off. The success from the real estate market is what put rocket fuel on the growth of the farm and then started getting into all, obviously, our other, our other industries. But for the majority of our lives, we were very, very, and still our blue car caller, but as far as the businesses go, we were not anything out of the norm. And I feel like that's that's crazy that the, the show skipped over something so huge that it was it starts off and it shows that 40,000 acres, that's a ton of land. It shows just these new John Deere's lined up for as far as you can see. You see just this whole operation that they they show these early photos and then it, it's like to this. I'm yeah. like, that doesn't just yeah. pop up overnight. No, you see the yeah. old farmhouse and the photos with us and like on a four wheeler in front yeah. of it. And then the next shot is like, the helicopter flying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, oh, damn, just snap your fingers and that happened. Yeah. Dude, they had a good few seasons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think it's also, it's crazy when you, you talk about your dad being that risk taker mm -hmm. and being that one that fears nothing. Mm -hmm. I think that is what makes people different in our world. There's It's a it factor of people that just don't fear things. And I also find it crazy how many people in our world now just fear finances. Mm -hmm. They're so fearful of failing mm -hmm. that... I feel like the show a lot targets around your dad just not being fearful of that. And they talk about numbers that most people can't even wrap their heads around. Yeah. But it's just like he conditions himself over and over and over to run to that level and take that stress on his own his own shoulders. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it, and it's not I wish we could say we were more intelligent, um, <laughs> but our success has not come by any way of intelligence whatsoever. It's just come through sheer tenacity and perseverance and just saying, hey, we're going to jump in with both feet forward and figure it out. Like we'll, we'll keep our head above water until we figure it out and make it profitable one way or another. And, um, that's how he's lived his life. I'm sort of of that same mindset. I'm not as much of a risk taker as he is like he, his ability to manage stress and, uh, stay positive and optimistic throughout the most negative situations is unbelievable. Like in the, in the show, you know, he's, um, He's a character. There's no doubt about it. And uh, a lot of his personal life is is shown and um, a lot of his flaws are shown. But I feel like they didn't capture how brilliant that man is at very tough situations and how to manage stress. He can do things that no one else in our entire company portfolio can. So I think a lot of times when you take this, uh, I want to say the, this modern world, uh, what am I trying to say? video crew mm -hmm. and producers, they can't wrap their mind around what that stress looks like. They don't see the value in somebody being able to take on that stress. Mm -hmm. That it's a whole different thing that, I mean, three and a half years ago, I probably wouldn't have even been able to understand it. And it was something that our dad took on for a long time that I never really understood. Mm -hmm. But I think you also coming into the business and being at a CEO level now are starting to understand it on a probably different level. What did it look like you coming into that position mm -hmm. within the company? Well, I think that I came at it from a little different perspective. So my dad had no formal education whatsoever. Harley had a high school education. Like he was basically a high school dropout that got his GED. And I went to college, got my MBA emphasis on, on finance and accounting. I was like the polar opposite of, of him in that he was like the bad boy risk taker. And, I was like this straight A, like disciplined, <laughs> super straight and narrow student. Um, and so I came into his business world and I'm watching his ability to manage stress and like just get crisis call after crisis call and then be like, what are you doing tonight? You want to go play some pool or something? And I'm like, how do you, like I, that would have sit me like through the roof. I'd have been, I don't know, I'd find the nearest bridge to jump <laughs> off of. And you're just laughing about it. Um, and so I tried to take what I consider my strengths, which are organization and discipline and mesh that with his ability to handle stress in tough situations. And I think, think that our skill sets complement each other so well. And me getting into the businesses, I think he viewed as a, a huge relief for him because he doesn't even know how to work email. Like he truly does not know how to work email. He doesn't know how to do anything organized. If you ask him to show up to the same meeting at the same time, two weeks in a row, he may make the first meeting be 15 minutes late to that one. And then there's not a shot in hell he's making it to the second <laughs> one. Like consistency is not him whatsoever. Um, and so whenever you pair my uh, skill sets with his ability to manage stress, it's like the perfect compliment. And I think that's really what's made our businesses uh, be as successful as they have been. So 
I, I think it's funny when our dad tells us stories of when he was growing up and he was the the one that missed class. He was the one that did all these different things. That was just like he pushed us so hard in the opposite direction. Was your dad the same way with like you Dude. have to be a straight A student? You have to do all these things that you hear these stories and they were nowhere near that. No. But you get a whole different level of pressure. And you being the oldest, I was the oldest. My dad was just I had a whole different level of what he did my direction. Did you see the same thing when you were growing up? Absolutely. So Jesse, my brother, that's just under me and and I, when we were in school, if we had a 92%, he'd be like, hey, you need to get that up to an A. I'm like, it's an A minus. Like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> it's, I'm still the, at, it's still the same letter. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, no, you need to get that up. And I'm like, you didn't even graduate high school. <laughs> but no, he would be that strict with us. And I, I truly now I look back and I thank him for it and, and appreciate how strict both him and my mom were. Um, I don't know what the hell happened with Cole. They fell off. <laughs> I think they got aged out of parenting a little bit and they loosened up a little bit because then Cole just <laughs> fell off the, the wagon a little bit. But uh, for Jesse and I, they were that strict. Yeah, it, it was funny when Dre and I were growing up. It was Dre didn't want to do a lot of things I did because he saw how hard my dad was on me. Yeah. On things that Dre's like, I'm just, I'm not going to take that. I see, I see what Dane's getting over there. Maybe he's that's like, what, maybe that's what Cole's doing. Oh, he's like, he's like, why don't you want to do this? Like when we got into racing motorcycles, like Dane was very good, mm -hmm. like sponsored by some of the top brands in the country. And we traveled racing. And my dad's like, why don't you want to race? I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. Mm -hmm. He's like, why? I'm like, I don't like putting on the gear. He's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. I would see Dane cornered in the trailer like, you won, but you only like barely won. <laughs> yeah. He's like, why didn't you beat him by 15 seconds? He's like, you could have been faster here, here, and here. And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I don't want like, any part of that. I'm yeah. like, you know what? Looks fun. I'll go play in the dirt. I was like <laughs> but, six. I'm like, I'm along for the ride. <laughs> but it, it was crazy when at that point that I had my dad as just like, it was somebody I always wanted to impress. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to, to do right by him. But it was also this like, I had a fear factor with it, but it's also like I had this like, this dude just an asshole to me all the time. Like yeah. it was just so many different things that like you process at that time that I look back at now that I'm so thankful, thankful mm -hmm. that he was that way because I look at people our age don't run and operate the same. They didn't have that upbringing. They didn't have that. I think that instills the discipline. It's how you do one thing is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. And it, it is crazy when I started watching the show, like right out the gate, it was, I saw so many sim similarities on different things in just that relationship alone. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, looking back now, I mean, I'm so thankful for it. And it's funny you mentioned that, like Cole, this is an absolute true story. Jesse and I had never touched alcohol. I think I was 21 or 22 years old. I remember this up at the farm. My brother, who's 14 years old, Cole, walks in, he's like, Steven, try this beer. Like Cole's like hammered. And I'm 22 years old, never touched a beer in my life or any type of alcohol. And he's handed me one as my 14 year old brother. <laughs> yeah, Jesse and I were raised a little different than Cole. Yeah. <laughs> so did you drink it? I did. <laughs> yeah, my younger, my 14 year old brother was the one that got me to drink the first time. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you know, most, yeah. most most of those stories go, my first drink with my dad. First drink with my 14 year old my brother. brother. <laughs> yeah. So as the, as the farm's evolving mm -hmm. and everything's moving upwards, when did you guys start looking at different endeavors on different business lines? When did that kind of become something you wanted to look at? The minute I truly dove into the farming operation and saw how rough that business model is and how inconsistent the revenue is, I instantly knew like, hey, if we want to keep this farm long term and we want to be able to feed all the mouths that we have, including, you know, my younger brothers and then the team that we've got here at the farm, we've got to be able to supplement that income and have some more consistent, reliable income from some of these other business models that are far and away better than what we've got going on at the farm. Because we're busting our ass up there seven days a week and all of our work could be wiped away with one rain or one big drought, like all of that can be wiped away. And I'm sitting here watching these freaking what I consider idiots on the internet selling some sort of software, just getting rich for, <laughs> I mean, just stupid margins. And I'm like, all right, there has to be a better way to make money than what we're doing farming. And, and our hearts are with farming and ranching. Like We love it. That's what we're always going to be involved with. And I knew we're always going to have the farm, but it's like, we've got to figure out a way to, to work smarter as well. And I think that's also diversified a uh, portfolio in just life that mm -hmm. says, hey, there's some farmers that they may come to a spot that they can't keep a farm mm -hmm. and it gets sold off to 
I mean, the the biggest players in the country now, and it's it starts me. losing. It's it's a lot <laughs> <of me. laughs> no. Bigger players than me too. <laughs> but yeah. it, it starts getting sold off to Wall Street investors yeah. and things like that, and it's because they have the capital ran in other portfolio lines that they can keep it up and going. Correct. The that, guys that are buying farm ground now. They don't care if the farm operation makes money from it. They're literally just parking their money in a safe asset that makes them two to three percent per year. And then also they can offset their tax credits using the farm. There's so many tax credits you can offset if you make money elsewhere. So like these people that are buying all this farm ground now, they don't give a shit if it makes money on the farming side. Yeah. It's it's insane. So for a small town farmer and rancher, that is why you see, you know, five hundred thousand farms in the last two decades being lost because it's just impossible to make it profitable nowadays. So the whole time you guys were come scaling up the farm side, mm -hmm. because 2018, you really ramp up. Mm -hmm. Was that on the cattle side and crop, or did you go one way, then start diversifying the other way? We got into the cattle side in 2010, um, mm -hmm. and we started with about 100 head. And we built that up in 2018, we were at about, 800 animals. Now we're right around 2000 to 2200. Um, so they both scaled up simultaneously, the row crop a little more. Um, but the cattle side is now it's kind of flip flopping. Now it's like the cattle sides where I'm trying to scale and the row crop side, I don't need to scale as much because the cattle side has more potential. So why do you see the cattle side having more potential? So the end goal, like if I could reverse my dream back to 2012, 2013, when I was getting out of high school. And I had this diagram and I have literally had this thing for over 10 years now. And it's basically a uh, continuous ecosystem. It's a vertically integrated ecosystem. At the top, you have our farming operation that grows the crops and you uh, go to the next uh, portion of the cycle and it's the cattle or the animals living on our farm feeding on the crops and the pasture that we raise. The next one is those animals being slaughtered and turned into food products. And right at the heart of it is the farmer and rancher. So basically it's this vertically integrated ecosystem of how I envisioned our farm could look one day where we're growing the crops, uh, where, you know, have the cattle and the animals that are being born and raised on our pastures and our farms. We feed them on our grain that we grow. We then slaughter them and package them in our own facility. And then we send them out to the end consumer. And that farm to table model was my vision that I had for the farm 12, 13 years ago. And it just has come to fruition here over the last couple of years. Wow. He was a lot further ahead of me than when I came out of high school. <laughs> uh, well, I, that's, that's always been my passion and what I wanted to do. I mean, we've always loved the farm so much. I was just like, what would be the coolest thing to me is to have someone in California. Okay, maybe not California. <laughs> <laughs> wrong, wrong state to pick. Yeah. But uh, let's say someone, you know, over in Nevada or Utah receive a package from my farm and there's a QR code on that package of that steak. And it takes you back to a video of the exact pasture where that cow was born, raised and what we fed it. And like just the whole process. That to me is such a cool story. That is. And that so right out of high school. So little rewind a little bit. When I talk about we were raised similar. I don't know if I broke that connection somewhere where I wasn't that I was always driven. I worked really hard. But I didn't have that smarter, not harder mentality till later on. It took a while for me to understand what my dad meant by that. Cause he always says work smarter, not harder work, but he was always the hardest worker in the room. And I was just like, it's following so, his lead. Yeah, thinking so I just it. felt followed his lead. And I mean, there's plenty he had hundred, 150 people working for him. He had all these different things happening. And I was just like, but he was the hard worker in the room. So I didn't understand it. And coming out of high school, I'm 17 years old. I'm assuming you were probably, you graduated 12. Uh, 13. 13. Yeah. So coming out at that point, were you the same way as you are? Did you already have that drive, that fire in you or did no. it come later? No, I was, I was a straight out. I was super disciplined um, coming out of high school. But honestly, what did it? I thought I was going to be a Division One football player, and that was my plan all along. And I played in a Missouri-Kansas All-Star game in June after I graduated. So it would have been a month after I graduated. And the only reason I played in this game was because my head coach and a bunch of my buddies had been selected for it. And I'd never been hurt before. Literally first play of the game, blew out my, my right knee. And so like, it was like my whole world was flipped upside down. Before then I was like, I had dreams of the NFL. I was never gonna make it to the NFL, but that's what you <laughs> believe at the time. And so like, I was like, oh, football is my identity. That's who I'm gonna be, that's my career. And then that all got turned on its head in one play into an all-star game. And had surgery that summer 
and I'm sitting there in a straight leg brace, like depressed as hell. Cause this was supposed to be like the big going away summer that you have with all your buddies before you go to college. And I'm sitting there in the straight leg brace. I remember on the 4th of July, I was sitting in my parents' bedroom watching fireworks go off. Cause there was a big party. They had a big party outside and I'm laying in bed and I'm like, this sucks. And I was in a deep, dark hole. And that was like the first time I ever fell into uh, like personal development books and self-improvement books. And really since that summer, um, it was like a six month process of like, all of a sudden I just started reading every self-improvement book I could read because it made me feel better. Like I was like, oh, there's life outside of my football identity. Like I could actually make something of myself. And really since that time, it's been an ongoing process ever since. Yeah, I think a lot of, there was a point when I got towards the end of my college career, mm -hmm. I started reading these self-development books, things like that. But it was things that just went, went in one ear out the other. I was reading them, but I didn't know how to take action with them. Mm -hmm. And it was, a. I meet a lot of people that read a lot of books. They can just regurgitate everything, but they don't implement any of those things into their real life. Yeah. And yeah. I have a lot of respect for people that read those, but I can also just see the way that they carry themselves, the way that they actually implement those things that they do read. Yep. And I wish I could have picked that up earlier. Yeah. Well, and I would say I agree with that for like two years. Like I, I got off on reading those books. It was yeah. like a mental masturbation. Like you read it and you're like, oh yeah, I feel good about myself. And then you yeah. don't do anything about it. Exactly. Yeah. You're reading it and you're talk. it's going over. Like I remember reading extreme ownership. I mean, years ago. And when I read it, I was like, that's me. That's me. And then I'm sitting there. I'm like, year forward. I'm like looking back at situations. I'm like, totally wasn't me. Yeah. Like, yeah. Not at all. Like this situation <laughs> wasn't me. Like I implemented it in like 2% of the things I wasn't like, but then really just hyper focusing on those different things that you learn from those books to actually move the needle forward all the time. So once again, if I could have implemented that two, three years earlier, can you imagine how far further ahead you'd be? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's actually depressing if you think about it. And I know everyone looks back like, Oh, if only, but damn, if you could have done half of those things a couple years earlier, it would have, you just seen the exponential growth so much faster. And it, it's funny. So many people go back and they're like, oh, I wish I could have done this. Or like, I wish I could have done this. I literally wish I could go back. And I would have been more open to learning sooner. Mm -hmm. That yeah. once you turn your brain on to open it up to actually learning and implementing, it was great. I'm, I'm going to say that was something I found in MMG mm -hmm. when I started this. Yep. It, it wasn't something that I, I had when I started this. But... I see that how many people do you guys have within your operation from farm to car washes to meat company to Apex? Uh, we just hit 375 employees across the portfolio. So I look at also a lot of times when you get to that level, mm -hmm. you have to become that leader. Mm -hmm. It's not an option. Yeah. You're either it's forced. Sink, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's either sink or swim at that point. Yeah. And you can read that book, but those 300 plus people don't give a shit about what you read. Mm -hmm. It's how you implement it every day. And I have a lot of respect for what you've done and making it to that level and actually killing it at that level is a whole different game. It is. So. Well, and it's, uh, I appreciate that. And, you know, for us, we're learning every single day. I wouldn't say we're anywhere close to where we want to be or anywhere near perfect. I mean, there's, I get so many messages because from the outside looking in, everything always seems like a highlight reel, right? So yes. everyone's always <laughs> like, man, your companies are just awesome. Like, I want to come work for you because it just looks like it's fun every single day. And like, you guys just have it figured out. I'm like, buddy, <laughs> like, no, we like, I feel like I'm more of an idiot today. It, like, it's like every single new book I read or every single new thing that I implement, I realize with the more wisdom I have, the less I know, if that makes sense. And I know that whenever you become obsessed with learning, that's how you feel. It's like you expand your horizons and it's literally like you took uh uh, what is it? The red pill in the matrix where when you take it and it's like, Oh shit, there's a big world out here. Like I don't know anything. <laughs> I had a very similar conversation today. I was onboarding, uh, one of our, one of the new guys joining the team and I'm going over everything. He's like, man, I'm pumped. I'm like, I'm just letting you know, you've seen like five, maybe 5%. Yeah. Like what? I'm like, the other 95% is just us grinding. Yeah. So I'm like, yep. I just want to let you know we're transparent, right. but I'm like, it's not easy. Right. He's like, he's like, I know. He's like, I'm pumped. I was like, all right, let's go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're ready for it, that's great. That's what I tell people whenever they come in and they, the first thing is now they're starting to see us on social media before they work for us. 
And then they come in and it's like all oh, raw, raw. They see the videos and like, oh man, this is when do I get to fly the helicopter? Yeah, when it's going to be, it's gonna helicopter. be so much fun. And I'm like, man, I'm going to tell you what, like give it about a week and we'll yeah. see if you're saying the same thing. <laughs> but it is crazy how social media has just turned into this high, highlight reel of everything. Mm -hmm. That same way with our company. And we put out all the great things that happen every day, all the fun things. It's it's really hard to put out the, the grindy aspect of it day over day because I mean, that those are the hours that go in. Those that's all the pressure that most people don't see. That's talk about your dad, the stress that he holds on his shoulders on a lot of those things. Like that's what most people can't even comprehend. You, and, you can't even wrap your mind around what it feels like until you're in that situation. And that's why so many people, uh, I saw a video, it was the Nvidia's founder um, that creates the chips for AI. One of the most valuable companies, if not the most valuable company um, in the last two years. And he was talking about how if he could do it all over again, he knew what he, he knows now, he wouldn't have started the company in the first place because of how hard it is. And it's like, you don't know what you don't know. So like, if you're not dealing with that stress day in and day out, you can't even begin to wrap your mind around what it feels like. And I think it's, it's just leveling up in a game mm -hmm. that as you progress, it gets harder and harder and harder. And I think a lot of people think that there's this like break point that it just all becomes easy. And all it is is your scale is just multiplying. Your complexity level just keeps going up. Mm -hmm. And like reading the book Scale Up, they talk about how just complexity multiplies so fast with communication. Mm -hmm. That was something MMG scaled up and then we fell off the map a little bit. And of course, I'm looking, I'm like, what the, what's the problem? And I take a step back, look at myself. I was the problem. Mm -hmm. I didn't build the processes correctly. I didn't put the line of communications in correctly. And it's nothing to a scale of what you guys are running, but it's like you guys still are putting in processes and all these different things every single day mm -hmm. to make all these different businesses run that you're talking about the car washes when they open up, like just the implementation of what you think scale is possible to once it actually is put into place that putting on paper, it all looks dandy. Like it looks amazing. Like I literally <laughs> thought when we opened those car washes, I was like, they're just going to run them. Like I, you know, we obviously we had some systems in place and I was like, Oh yeah, this is like fully encompassing. I've thought of every single scenario. <laughs> like they, I'm just going to, you can just run this company by reading the processes that I've set up. And it was not like that. And like you said, like it's like every single new level you enter scaling is not linear because every single new level that you hit, it's like you have a drop off where like there's so many gaps that you didn't realize needed to be there. And then it takes a while to catch up to where you can advance to the next level. But it's never yeah. just like you just soar through scaling. Yeah, it's not like that. And it's funny, too, because every time when you're in a whole new like learning phase, I, I talk in the office all the time that you take two steps backwards to take 10 forward and it's just keep taking those two steps backwards mm -hmm. that you're reallocating time to learn new things to then set yourself up for the future to be able to get to the next spot. Yep. And most people are always just driving forward so fast fast or trying that they're not looking what's behind them. They're not looking how to play in front of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's where when I opened the, the marketing, I, I had it all written out. I, I had all these scratch papers when I left the dealership. I'm like, shit, I got to figure it out. Easy, yeah. <laughs> this, this is easy. I'll, I'll yeah. be sitting on the beach running this company. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't talk about two years in, I'm sitting in the driveway. I'm like, shit, I can't make payroll. I don't know what to do. I got to go take a line of credit out against my house. Yeah. And those aren't the things that they tell you about, but it's, those are also the places that you're like, I'm in the arena to fight. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you were positioned to be there for a reason. Exactly. And it's, I think the story of what you guys have built in the period, the, the time frame is what blows me away the most, I think. It's, the, it, we built it by hustle. Like I said, it's not intelligence by any means. And if I could, if I could do it all again, I would focus more on creating the systems and, and measuring twice cutting once rather than the way that we did it, but we've survived. <laughs> but I, I'll say from your, I'm going to say I have probably a lot of what your dad has where I'm going to say these two are both the measure twice cut once. Mm -hmm. I'm the full speed right out the gate kind of guy, yeah. but it's, it's constant movement. It is. And it's one of those things that a lot of times there, the people around me keep me in direction correctly. Yeah. But I have to have constant movement. I have to have something that's happening, good, bad, and different something. Yeah, if you're going stale, like if, if things are not shaking and moving, yeah, just go crazy. I would rather just ever, just running shit in the dirt, figuring out what's not working over here. Yeah, something to be pressing for. Yeah, because the second I feel like stagnant, it like eats me away. Mm -hmm. 
And it's like, I hate a comfortable spot. And I think it's, you start getting that just, I don't know, that internal thing that you just, that dis, that discomfort is where you find comfort. Yeah. That that's where you know where you're finding that progression. I always thought growing up, um, you know, as I, and I'm not old in business, obviously, but as I got a little more experience in business, I was always trying to, to find that comfort zone where it's like, I can relax and it doesn't feel like I'm like just trying to keep my head above water each and every day. And there's been a couple times where I hit it and I realize like when I'm in that zone, my stress and anxiety are worse than they ever are. Whenever I've like just moving to try and keep things alive or keep surviving because you're so caught up in like just keeping the company going, you don't have time to like get stressed and anxious over sitting still. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's like, like you're uh, like, I've got too much shit to worry about right now. It's like when you got the really active dog, like German Shepherd, something like that. They got to have something to do. If yeah. They're just sitting there enjoying life. Yeah. It doesn't last very long. No, that's exactly yeah. right. We found ourselves like every single vacation we go on, we end up getting a plane ride home two days early. Like we literally yeah. would do that. I find myself, I love vacations. I can't go on one longer than three days. Because yeah. if I'm gone for longer than three days, I'm catching a flight home early because I'm like, I, I hate sitting here. Yeah, it, it's one of the it's almost a curse, I feel like, where I take vacations and you asked them the last vacation. I was on, I'm sitting on the beach and yeah, we and all really enjoyed it. So <laughs> I'm on vacation. I'm like sending text messages to them. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm sitting on the bo- on the beach reading a book right now and we are not doing this, this and yeah. this. I'm like, I want to set this meeting up for next week. We need to get this all in place and then Mass and she's just like, can you just slow down for a minute? I'm like, no. I was like, I look at it as a body in motion stays in motion. Yeah. Just keep it moving. Yeah. And it's, I think I'll, we've talked a lot on business development, things like that, the evolution of what you guys have done. I want to talk a little bit about the show on just like yeah. overall. Like, Well, I felt like uh, we skipped a show before this show. Oh, yeah. We'll talk about the first, <laughs> we'll talk about the first show that you yeah. were on. So I actually, I haven't watched that one. Uh, Don't. My, <laughs> don't so he is not well, the millionaire <laughs> or is he hey well now everyone's saying that they're all like shocked because the first show i was uh joe millionaire and then the second show now we're talking about all this debt and they're like oh shit he's average joe again <laughs> <laughs> the the funny thing though on that topic which that was something also that i thought about when watching it mm-hmm. is how many people i knew like right when you start talking about that mm-hmm. they're like oh my god they don't have any money they have debt like People don't know how to leverage debt. People don't understand, like, you find the, the richest people in the country, they have debt. Yeah. Like, debt is something that if you understand how to use it, it's actually a huge business tool. Yeah. And I think that's really funny when people probably watch that and they're like, well, they just have debt. They don't have any money. Oh, oh I, there's so many comments. Right why do now they keep it? giving them more? Yeah. <laughs> they're like, why why do they give them more money? <laughs> yeah, they're like, how the hell? That doesn't even make sense. I'm like, yeah. I actually just play along with it because it's funny to me. That's normally the person that can't finance a fifteen thousand dollar car, even yeah. so. And yeah. they're like, "Yeah, I don't like that. I buy cash cars, five hundred dollar <laughs> cash cars, because I'm smart with my money." Yeah, you're right. I keep them like, every three months. I get a new one. Yeah, you, you struggle to make every payment that you have, and you drive a cash car, and you're a financial wizard. But for show, yeah. for show. Yep. <laughs> so, what did Joe Millionaire look like on that? Well. First show, so they reached out to me on Instagram DMs, and I thought it was a joke. Um, but the whole reason I went on that first show, full disclaimer, was to try and get what the second show has become. I didn't go on there to try and find love. Granted, I ended up finding a woman, <laughs> obviously still dating Cal, like, and I hate to say that in front of her whenever yeah. she's around, but and, and I'll tell her, tell it to her face too. Like I didn't go on there for love. Most people don't go on reality shows for love. Um, so I flew down to uh, outside of Atlanta, filmed for seven or eight weeks. It was really outside of my comfort zone. Like, man, I only got my phone for three hours a day. And to try and keep the companies afloat, that was 2021. Um, and so I was in the position that I'm in now and trying to keep the companies running while I was gone for three hours a day, I was just making calls like nonstop. So how did that go over with your dad when you made that decision? (laughs) We were weighing the (laughs) risk reward of things. And we said the potential reward of this outweighs the risk of you being gone for seven weeks. Like we can hold the fort down. The businesses are going to stagnate. Like we're not going to achieve any sort of growth. But if as long as we don't go backwards, we're fine. Um, And so I left and they did. They held the fort down. They did a really good job when I was gone. And I would just have three hours every morning to make my calls, just try and make sure there was no fires I needed to put out. And then it was just filming all day long. And it was like 
very controlled environment, uh, 200 person production crew. Just a few. Yeah, just a few. <laughs> I mean, there was, uh, there was, on Joe Maynard, there was a full team of paramedics, probably 12 people. Hmm. Yep. Just for you? Yeah, just for me. <laughs> no, I did. Um, embarrassing to admit, I had my hair cut every single day. I had a stylist and then I had a makeup artist. <laughs> Reality TV, man. They got hey, sure I love it. No I hate to, bad hair. I hate to say this, but I loved it. It was nice. <laughs> come back like, to the farm I'd like going. wake up. I was like, where's my barber? <laughs> <laughs> then you come back to the farm. It's like, we're showering in your creek today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you hit Joe Millionaire. Mm-hmm. How did Joe Millionaire end? I have no, I haven't watched it. Or we can um, tell everyone out there how it ends. <laughs> so hang on. I got to think back. Okay. So it uh, came down to two women. They still didn't know. There was two guys. One of us was wealthy. One of us was not. The women never knew. Um, and so I, you're friends with the other guy. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And he's a very successful general contractor out of Charlotte. Like yep. clearing six figures a year. Very successful. But they made him out. And they were just bashing him. There was a host on the show that was the butler. Um, and we'd sit down in interviews and the butler would be like, now, Kurt, I know women have left you because you're so uh, broken. You just don't have the money to afford a date. Do the women have to pay for your dates? I mean, just like bash the guy. We make six figures a year. <laughs> but he's a cool dude, so he just played into it. Um, and then for me, I had to downplay the farming realm. So I said, I told the women that I had a couple cows and had a small family farm is kind of how we, we ran with things. And it worked out perfectly because I'm a blue collar farmer. Like I work with my hands most days. I mean, it's not like I'm some, you know, white collar walking around in a fancy suit and tie. So I wear jeans and a ball cap every day. So it, they had no idea. Yeah. Um, and ended up getting down to the end of the show, uh, came down to two women and I chose, uh, Calla had been on three dates with Calla the entire show. Didn't even know really who she was. So after the cameras are off, um, that first night we're together, the cameras are nowhere to be found. The show's done shooting. Like Cal and I basically like reintroduced ourselves and I was like, Hey, like you're cool. Obviously I think you're hot. I think you're a cool person. (laughs) We're not in a relationship. Like we got, I have no idea who you are. (laughs) And she was like, I completely agree. Like, I I don't know you from Adam. And so we kind of like restarted the entire like process again, ends up, we were very compatible and things worked out. So, so did you have a social media presence before then? Or I did. So, uh, when my brothers and I were, this has been 2016, 2017. We were on uh, the Outdoor Channel for hunting shows. Mm. Um, so we were with Jury Outdoors, and then we also had our own show on the Pursuit Channel. So we were very accustomed to being on camera um, and also the whole production side of it, which I had no idea how that was ever going to benefit me. And now years <laughs> later, it came full circle. And my dad would always get pissed about how much time I spent filming hunts. And I was like, yeah, look now. Like, look so at- he had a little, he was set up for it a little bit by the time Joe Millionaire came. From that. Yes. Okay. Yep. That makes a little more sense because I'm sitting there thinking if we're in the dealership space, I came to my dad. I was like, hey, TV show wants me to come on. I'm going to be gone for <laughs> seven weeks. Yep. He'd say, get the fuck out of here. He's like, no, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, he, he, you know, he had seen us go on, on the outdoor channel and knew that we were in that line of business. And uh, the entire time I kept telling him like, hey, attention is the new currency. Like everything I'm reading, like, you know, the money is going to flow where the attention is. And if you can get eyeballs on it, you're going to make money from it. Like, look at these newest millionaires. It's all these freaking vloggers and YouTubers. And, uh, at the time it was what Vine that had all the attention. RIP. Yeah. Yeah. RIP. But that was like, I've seen everyone just make millions overnight. I'm like, we need to start like building our presence on social media and and building our, the attention and getting these eyeballs. And that was the very start of it. Yeah. And that's, it's crazy that most business owners don't understand that. And I feel like that's one of the biggest differences between small business and large business yeah. is understanding attention is value and understanding how to acquire it yeah. and willingly acquiring it. That people buy from people, sell the personality, sell people. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's so many companies put things out. I'm like, would you look at that? Right. I'm like, no. Yeah, it sucks. Like, yeah. Why would somebody else? Like, yeah. Go earn people's attention. Mm-hmm. So I like the fact that you you noticed that at an early age. And I mean, you've it just teared it the, up one after yeah, another. Just thanks to the books I was reading and really the the personal development I was working on. That's where I saw, you know, the Gary V's of the world. The Andy Frisella's at the time was taken off with uh, uh, MF CEO projects. I mean, podcasts were blowing up at the time. I was like, man, if we could do something to get some attention over here and um, going on a TV show, I was like, that'll 
you know, pour, pour rocket fuel on our attention. You know, if I tried to build it organically, that's pretty tough. But if I could be on a TV show, that would help out tremendously. It's um, a nice jump start. It's a nice jump start. <laughs> and I was like, I think I could probably, yeah, pour some rocket fuel on this growth. So how much did Joe Millionaire fuel that far? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> it's the second show now. <laughs> I keep saying it's going to be the next one, <laughs> but it did not help at all. I was, um, show was a flop rating sucked. Uh, it did not pan out. Um, you know, I think I got, I don't know, 50,000 followers from it. Um, but as far as like converting those into buyers in any sort of way, it was, it was non-existent. Uh, but the whole reason I went on Joe Millionaire was to showcase the farming operation because Yellowstone at the time, I'd just been introduced to Yellowstone in 2021. I was like, damn, my brother looks exactly like Casey. I fly a helicopter. Like we have a big farming operation. My dad is like kind of John Dutton, like not, not as cool as John Dutton, but he kind of <laughs> has some similarities. Um, and I was like, I think we could turn this into a reality show. And so I was like, I got to get my foot into whatever door reality TV is in. And that opportunity presented itself. I knew they were going to do a hometown package. And that's how this McBee dynasty came about was producers got out there, saw our farming operation. And after Joe Millionaire, I was getting called from, five to six different production companies about this show, about the McBee Dynasty. So did you guys create, you guys created and want to do the McBee Dynasty? So and basically created the real life Yellowstone concept. Um, and then I was talking to, like I said, five to six different production companies. I wanted to choose a production company that would let us be us and let us tell our story the way we wanted to tell it, not manipulate it. Because there's, you got to be careful with you know, some reality shows because they can completely spin. You, there's a lot of trust that has to be extended because let me tell you, they can spin the narrative so fast. Um, and then also I wanted a production company that I felt had the track record of success. So whenever Jeff Jenkins reached out and we started talking about the show concept, what it could potentially be, and you look at Jeff Jenkins Productions, they did The Simple Life with Paris Hilton, Nicole Richie, major hit. They did the first 10 seasons of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, major hit. They did and do Bling Empire on Netflix, which is a major hit. And I was like, all right, these guys have a track record of success. The way they're wanting to do the show falls in line with how we wanted to present ourselves. And there was a lot of symmetry there and, and felt really comfortable about things. Did did you want the show to turn into what it is? Are, are you happy with the direction that it's at? Did you want it to be more business oriented or they came on and they say, hey, you it's got reality TV, but it's, it's like reality there's TV. sometimes that there's when you live inside of it all the time, yeah. you don't see the the value that there actually is that I look at us growing up. If there would have been cameras, if we would have been halfway intelligent to throw cameras on stuff, Our dad would be in prison. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's just like, I mean, it was we had a, a compound that we did whatever we wanted. We had motorcycles everywhere, golf carts everywhere. What? The Deegans and Travis Pastrana and all those guys were doing. We did it out at our house and we did it all growing up. Like They did the mm -hmm. same thing. They just put a camera in front of them. And yeah. then now look where they're yeah, at. Yeah, look at where they're at now. Yeah, it's nuts. And I uh, I mean, as far as the way the show has come out, I wish there was a little more of the business side of things, like a little more of what I would consider higher converting to sales and actual income mm -hmm. um, type of content. But also I understand it's a ratings push. And so the drama is what the eyeballs are are brought by. And I also think long-term, a lot of times where in the short term, people look at a uh, conversion rate really quick, mm -hmm. but they're also, I know you guys are ways down the road, but also the car wash space is new. The, the meat facilities are new. Like there's a lot of new, verticals that you guys are in yeah. that that overall brand awareness gets to where it starts just holding a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. And we look at it as like getting that super high level of exposure. And then it's, what do you do to hold that traffic long-term? Yeah. Because you can catch the attention once, but then how do you retain that attention to then ask for the sale when you need it? Exactly. That if you have that crazy high level of brand awareness and you've held them up there, you can get them on social platforms. You can retain that that attention over time, when you go to ask for that sale, you're not going to have to try to hit someone seven to 10 times. Yeah. You can you're get not reintroducing yourself yeah. for the first time. So yeah. now all of a sudden, most companies don't have the opportunity to run straight bottom funnel sale yeah. conversion ads that they convert, that you're building the whole thing as a, a big picture marketing view. You're building the whole thing to go attack the bottom funnel easily. 
Exactly. And we always say play the long game. And so I'm like, on one hand, obviously, you know, I was like, oh, I wish they'd show, you know, stuff that would convert better and showcase like why our businesses are better, why McBee meat is better, why the car wash is better. But like you said, that brand awareness, number one, the high level brand awareness, but number two, if we were to have a crazy amount of traffic to our businesses in season one, I don't have the system set up yet to where we could perform on a stupid amount of traffic. So it actually gives me a little bit of time to scale up too. So I'm actually not mad about it. And then we also chose to go with uh, NBCU because as long as the ratings are there, we'll run this show to the wheels fall off. Whereas a Netflix, even if it was a hit show, it's got a three to four season lifespan and that's it. What? Why is that with them? Do you know? Just fresh new content is what they're focused on. Like nonstop fresh new content, even if it's a hit show. Because I, I looked at they, they didn't want to bring back a season two of Squid Games or whatever. Yeah. And it was like one of their highest hit shows that they've well, ever they had. had that and then Mr. Beast came out, outperformed Netflix on, I think it was a six or eight million dollar budget yeah. compared to what Netflix did. And then everyone's like, and now they're bringing a season two back because of what he did. Yep. And but I was like, bro. Yep. It, it's, I think some of these big production companies want something so new all the time that when you have things that hit that people like, I mean, there's some, I mean, I still watch Pawn Stars and there's like 24 yep. seasons or something. Yep. I don't know. Like, I like watching it. It's easy TV to go to bed at night. But it's just like you look at these different you, you things. You just said easy TV to go to bed. They don't want you to go to bed. They want you to binge it and watch like four or five episodes. Well, my TV's still on afterwards. It's giving them a rating and I'm not even awake. They're like, hey, yeah, the, I mean, this is high ratings, but half these people can be asleep. So, yep. but I mean, we've put presidents in office that way. True that. So, uh, so what out of all the verticals that you have right now, where is like your time most spent? So right now it's a toss up between the car washes and then the meat company. Um, been gearing up to distribute nationwide. So similar to like a butcher box or an Omaha steaks model. And we're building out a fulfillment center to be able to fulfill all of our orders in house um, and just the logistical, logistical challenges of that. And then also gearing up for the marketing side of that's been most of my time over the last year. Yeah. The farm's really, um, we've got some great people in place, uh, excluding my brother Cole, um, that do a good <laughs> job of running the farm. Uh, and the car washes have done really well too. I'm still pretty involved with those, but that, that meat company is the next big hurdle for me. So that's where I've been spending a lot of my time. So spending your time towards that, it have your brother stepped up more on the farm side are they running? Are you? Are they kind of coming up? Because I know the the show it kind of portrayed this almost uh, kind of totem pole of yeah level. Is it them more running the farm side and then Cole's, using all of them as having those trustworthy people at the top? Is you're gonna more. have to watch season two of the, McBee Dynasty. That's, yeah. right. <laughs> that's where you're gonna find give it. it all away. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, they all are stepping up. I mean, we all kind of have our specialty niches where we have our strongest skill sets in, um, but they have stepped up. Tremendously. And there's no way, like looking at the size of our companies now, there's no way like me individually could try to run them or my dad individually. Hell, it'd take like four or five of us to run it all. Yeah. And I know also when we're talking inside, you guys also build houses. We do. Yeah. yeah just as a hobby yeah. on the side. <laughs> Nick, we custom homes is a smaller, we do, uh, we've got a super over there that builds a incredible home, but we build, you know, 15 to 20 a year. Um, and it's a nice little company and we just haven't grown it at all, but it's a nice little company. Is that what Jesse's house was? Yes. Yeah. So how would- I'm assuming they probably didn't use a different builder. Just <laughs> Yeah, we, we paid a different builder. <laughs> nice house. <laughs> just really like that design. <laughs> so how would someone even get on the list for that? For our custom home site? Yeah. Uh, so mcbcustomhomes.com, uh, we're in the process of building a new website, but if you call in, Custom homes is re- really where we found our specialty. We don't do as much spec anymore. Some, you know, we do ten specs a year, um, but the custom home side is where we really shine. Like we're doing, hell, we're doing four different barn dominiums right now. We're building uh, Josh Hader. He's a lefty for the Astros. Just signed a big contract. He's got a big hunting farm up in North Missouri. We're building a really nice barn dominium for him, and, and we really excel in the the custom home side. Cool. Mm-hmm. So what what got you in the? What was the purpose? Of, I feel like there's. A lot of different things that you're doing. A lot of them kind of a line of one. I see the the car wash being just uh, a great revenue stream mm-hmm. and the the idea behind that. 
what was the spot of like, we're going to jump into homes? Uh, that had been my dad. Um, and I honestly couldn't tell you what made his mind want to start building homes. It would have been that same period in 2006 to 2008. Um, and he was already buying residential real estate, was buying multifamily homes as well and, and uh, apartment complexes. But um, I believe that it was just, it was right before the housing bubble burst and everyone was building homes. Like everyone jumped into the game. You'd have like plumbers or carpenters that would just be like, hey, I'm gonna build a home because you can make <laughs> money. Because you were, you were just making money hand over fist. It reminds me of a couple years ago before interest rates rose, everyone was getting into home building because you could just make money. Yeah. So they're like, what rates are at a two five? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I yeah. can do it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I also think anytime markets like that, I mean, people jump in on everything. And anything that seems to be an easy money grab, everyone everyone gets into it, and then all of a sudden the bubble bursts. Like everyone lost their ass in two thousand, you know, eight to two thousand twelve on home building, and then everyone like got out of the industry, and then my dad's just too stupid to quit anything and, and too <laughs> stubborn to quit anything, so he kept building homes through it, and then you know caught the next wave. Which I think people that are successful in any industry, it's who can endure the storm the longest, who yes. can keep fighting every single day and keep pushing. Yep. where you you hit these thresholds that oh wait right when everything happens it's i mean people flood out every different direction and there's people that make it to the next wave and it's like who makes it through the next wave and then it's like just enduring the, that storm just consistently all the time yeah. that sets you up for a completely different spot in the future like i i want things to slow down right like when we started in the marketing space everyone's like well it's not good right now because people are running leaner than ever like we were in the auto space where Vehicles, it's the only time in history, vehicles were more valuable than customers. Yeah. <laughs> Toward then we're like, oh, we got a shift. I'm like, what if we go to dealerships instead of selling, uh, we're going to help them sell cars, we're going to help them buy cars. Mm -hmm. Toward we like shift the whole narrative of what we were doing like that to pick up clients. But well, then we, we were telling someone about that the other day. They're like, you really thought about it that way? It's like, well, there's a way to make money. You just got to figure out a way to make money. Yeah. Well, and if, in an industry at that point, they're like, why would I need to market? Like, I have the car, they're coming to us. Yep. And if they're not paying for it, we have four more people lined up. So it's like, uh. <laughs> but it's looking at any business model of how do they move the needle forward? Right. That every business model you look at that, I mean, all the different verticals you're in, there's a way to move the needle forward in every single one of them. Sometimes it just has to be looked at a little differently. Mm -hmm. And that's where we've leveraged so many different companies in the marketing space is how do we look at it differently in the car space? It was in the times where vehicles became the most valuable thing. How do you get dealerships more vehicles? Right. That's what they'll pay for. That's their problem. And it's when we look at a business, it's how do we solve those problems for them? Mm -hmm. And most of the time, people on the other side of the fence, they're looking at how do they solve their own problems, which it's when you talk about that story of the full meat and the, the, the cycle, that is something that the story is the problem with most people towards like when you bring that whole thing full circle, you just solved a problem for a lot of people. Correct. That now they understand the whole thing. And most sometimes the problem doesn't have to be like a legitimate problem. It has to be how somebody understands something. Right. That if you clarify it to where somebody understands it, you're actually solving something. Yeah. If you just so, make it simple and easy to understand that in its in and of itself is problem solving. <laughs> yeah. So you also have, it's Apex? Yeah, yeah. So what? when did Apex become a thing? Uh, Apex was launched in November of 2020. Um, and basically that was my phase one into trying the distribution of meats. So that was shelf stable, ready to eat, meat sticks, beef jerky, summer sausage. That was, all right, I'm gonna try this out. I'm gonna start with a third party manufacturer. When that worked, I brought manufacturing in-house. I built out a 2,500 manufacture, 2,500 square foot manufacturing facility, basically bringing in box beef. I didn't want to. I didn't have a slaughterhouse to, to process my own, so brought in box beef, turned it into meat sticks, beef jerky, and summer sausage. That worked. Okay, so now that I learned that, now I can bring in the next phase of actually owning the slaughterhouse, sending my own beef through there, and then completing the whole raw beef distribution model. Um, that happened a lot faster than what I anticipated. Uh, that was going to be like a 2026 plan for me. And then last year, quite literally, it fell in my lap and I wasn't ready for it. But the opportunity that was there and the timing wise, I was like, I'll, I'll figure it out. What do you think the importance is? Like you talk about 
when you were talking about finding that facility up north, most people can have opportunity right in front of them and they can't see it. Mm -hmm. And I think the importance of just seeing opportunity when it's there and jumping on it. I feel like a lot of these stories that we've went over, a lot of these steps to the next level are just seeing that opportunity. It's just jumping on the opportunity. It's not like any, like there's no like grand scheme or like I had a better business model than you. It's just like I saw the opportunity and I went for it. So earlier when you were talking about measuring twice, cutting once, I think you're a lot more just the the step forward guy. I, I uh, yes, I am. Yeah, I, I'm not as bad as my dad. Like, <laughs> dude, if you told my dad about any business model in the world, like you could just say, "Hey, we're gonna start selling freaking dirty underwear on the internet right now," he'd be like, "Let's do it! Like, let's go tomorrow!" Yeah. And like, what's your just, use, how many after, this, yeah. after this podcast, you're gonna have people just sit. He's gonna be like, "I don't know how to use email, but you're gonna have to get in contact with me a different way." So he is like gung ho about anything out there and he's so passionate about it I, i'm not quite to that level but yeah i jump on opportunities i mean yeah. I, I have that entrepreneurial uh spirit inside of me to where like everything is good like everything looks awesome and i want to try it all um and it is true and i you know everyone you hear the old wise tale like oh you only have opportunity come in front of you like once in your life i'm like no opportunity happens non-stop it's just being able to understand what is opportunity and taking advantage of it like if you sit there we live in America where I bet you every single year, just for any single average person, there are three to four opportunities per year that if you took advantage of them could lead you down the road to financial freedom, whether that be a uh, multimillionaire, decamillionaire, whatever you want to call it, three to four opportunities a year. And people usually just sit by and just let it pass by and be like, man, I never have opportunity. It's like, dude, open your eyes. It's everywhere. It's, it's also, I think, building yourself into the person you start positioning yourself at the correct tables. You start positioning correct. yourself around the right people. And it's just all those things compound. Correct. And that personal development is a compounding thing that it's you become educated enough to talk to the next level. You start acquiring the confidence to talk to the next level. You start acquiring all these different characteristics to put you at that next level that I think a lot of times most people don't take. And they're like, well, I don't have any opportunity. And it's an uh, attitude problem. It's, yep. guess what? If you're some negative ass person that just looks at the, the, the negative side of everything, I promise you all these high level individuals that are positive thinkers that see opportunity everywhere. You sit at a table one time with them, within five minutes, like, I want this motherfucker gone. Yeah. Oh, they instantly Never feel that negative people. energy. Yeah. Oh, without a doubt. Why oh, you keep pointing <laughs> at me, bro? <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like, that's something people yeah. see. Like that, that's not something that goes unnoticed. Yeah. And it, I don't know if it's just like b teaching myself to be very self-aware or if it's just people really don't see that, but it's, I focus on attitude, like the positivity side, like seeing the opportunities. And there's some people that we talk about all the time. We'll hire people that we give them a golden opportunity right there and they can't take it. Right. Yeah. And then you it's see insane. people that just jump on everything that you look at what you've done on all these different verticals on not a crazy amount of time. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so true though. I mean, like you said, number one, the self-improvement side of things, like if you're able to work on your personal development and be able to enter rooms that previously you weren't able to, let's say the average person gets three to four opportunities a year. You could step that up to where if you're networking with the right groups and you're at the personal development level to where uh, you're talking to the right people and you have the skill set to be able to understand it, your opportunities could come about daily. Like you change that three to four times a year to like daily, you will get a call that could change your life. Mm -hmm. And that makes the opportunity of success way higher because you're having an opportunity to swing by every single 24 hours that you can take <laughs> advantage of. You know, if you're in the right room, the conversations are different. They are just different. I mean, I think about some of the dinners I go to now with some of the people I get to meet. I mean, it's not like, hey, what bar are we going to this weekend? Like some of the conversations you'd have with average buddies or average friends. It's like talking things that are next level where you're leave the dinner and you're like, wow, like the, the world is endless like there's so much possibility and so much opportunity out there and it, it's crazy when you see that that you talk about that as like as we've progressed in business it's crazy the doors that just keep opening up mm -hmm. but i've looked at it as we've been gifted a, a golden opportunity with the cool thing about what we do is we work with business owners all day every day mm -hmm. we have 100 plus companies that 
I mean, we actively are networking with every day. We're at networking events. Who so knows what it'll spin into? <laughs> the, the multiplier of it's crazy. Yep. And it's the, the podcast in the beginning, people were like, oh, you starting that for money? Are you doing like all that? I was like, this is just a huge networking thing. Yep. I was like, this is something that we give a voice to people that are at a very high level. We give a voice to people that haven't made it there. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that was something I wanted to retain with the podcast as big as it gets. That that new business owner that's two people, they can still come have a voice here. But it's networking on this all the time that I think a lot of people don't see the value in the networking side yep. in our world today, that it's not always what you know, but who you know. That More times than not. Yeah. <laughs> More times than not, that is the truth of the matter. For sure. But towards the end of the podcast, I mean, you guys are absolutely killing it. And like I said, the this, this show's... I've watched the whole show. I haven't watched Joe Millionaire, so. Yeah, like but. I said, don't watch that one. I, McBee Dynasty is enough of a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it, I mean, it's crazy cool to have a show like that produced. It's, I mean, you guys are 30, 45 minutes north of here. It's and, pretty neat. Um, yeah. We're lucky, extremely blessed to have the opportunity. And, I, you know, I, I don't have a crystal ball to see what the future holds, but um, I think there's going to be a lot of good things that come from this. Uh, and we're excited to see what the potential of it could be um future seasons you know spin-off shows whatever it could be uh it's just kind of wild to see how things have shaped out and what i think is really cool about too is i I feel like you had kind of this platform that you had you had went and captured this audience you had been leveraging that Mm -hmm. and i don't see the rest of the family was doing that and i think that kind of elevated all of them to bring them onto that same platform that you were at. I think that's pretty cool that the things that you had done had led to that. And then you just brought your whole family with you. It's so, pretty neat. It's yeah. pretty neat. Now my dad posts more content than I do. Like he's social media. <laughs> he's God. on there all the time. I did, I did see you got yeah. pulled over there. Yeah. No, you see that? Yeah. yeah. He's, he's like taking a selfie me. with the cop there. Yeah. I'm like, oh man. Yeah. No, it's true. I mean, it's pretty neat. And it just, it's humbling to know the wave of impact one person can have on and the ripple effect that you can have on so many lives. You don't think about it at the time. Like you don't think like, Oh, if I wake up with an optimistic attitude today and I like am around people and I just present good energy, like the ripple effect of how many lives that could potentially change in a positive manner. And I, you know, and I'm still at at fault here. I'm not, I don't wake up every single day with hundred percent positive energy and skip around and, and, you know, (laughs) light the world on fire. But it's when you actually sit down and think about it, it's pretty cool. Yeah, and you guys are doing that, and Thank no you. question about it. So, um, end of the podcast, last question I always ask is, if you could go back to your 21-year-old self, mm-hmm. tell yourself one thing, what would it be? Don't drink with the 14-year-old brother. <laughs> yeah, don't <laughs> Stay away from Cole <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. Um, if I could do things, if I could go back to 21 and tell myself anything, uh, it would probably be to really excel and master one single thing before trying to take it all on at once. And I know we've talked about jumping in both feet forward, but I feel like scaling actually works faster if you take it slower in the beginning and you focus on mastering the simple steps rather than just trying to throw mud at a wall and see what sticks. Cause that was kind of my thought pattern in my early twenties is like, I'm going to throw mud at a wall, all these different businesses. One of them will pop off into a home run. They don't just like hit like that. If I could just focus in on one single thing and become the absolute master, the best at whatever that one thing is, that to me is how you scale up faster than anyone else to where you could then hire the CEOs, you'll have enough income to hire the the people that you need to start those other businesses. Yeah. And I think a lot of t- most people try to be a jack of all trades, master of none. It never and works. It doesn't. And I think in today's world too, so many people are into this like serial entrepreneur that everyone's a serial entrepreneur now and they have a five failing businesses. Correct. And that none of three of which make zero money Two of barely make any and it's just just so they can have that title and i think it's an ego driven thing yep. and then they're talking to somebody that has one business like well you only have one business i have five right. and it's i've ran into those people they're like well is that like the only thing you do that used to be me it, uh, uh, like, it used to be me and i'm like yeah. those other you, four are tax write-offs just so you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they're like 
that that's like your only business i'm like yeah it's my only business like we, we do well like that's where i focus all my effort oh you need to be doing this this and this and so i think it's just something that's came with our our world our generation a lot too that they think that that's some accolade to that's the viewpoint of success is like it doesn't matter how successful the businesses are it's just you gotta have multiple like yeah yeah Big baller rolling around. I own all yeah. these companies. No, I mean Bezos has one. I think so. Yeah, I think I mean, he's, he's, he's a, doing all right. Yeah, I think he only owns thirteen percent of it too. <laughs> so, so yeah, they got to move bridges to get his boats out of yeah. harbor. So yeah, <laughs> historical bridges. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's so, a different price tag. <laughs> I, I would say he's done okay. Yeah, just a little bit. But any final thoughts? Man, I appreciate you guys having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to to be on this platform and have this voice. And I always sincerely enjoy the podcast where I relate to uh, everyone that I'm talking to more so than where I go on a podcast and I just talk about, you know, the drama that happens on reality. TV. <laughs> yeah, whenever we can get into some deeper substance, the stuff that I actually care about, I always enjoy the podcast a lot more. So in saying that, this is one that I've certainly enjoyed. I, I certainly enjoy you coming on and um, I think you guys are doing big things and it's going to do nothing but get bigger as we go. So, or as you go. So uh, Thank you. we'll keep watching and, uh, I like all the stuff you're doing. You got, you were talking inside. You got a few other things happening here soon. So yeah, got a few other things in the works. Some ex but. exciting projects coming up here. I'll uh, maybe doing a little bit of traveling for. So. Yeah, but keep killing it. And once again, greatly appreciate you being on. And thank you, Dre. Thank you, Ricky. That's thank the M3 podcast. Thanks for listening to the M3 podcast. M3 podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Want to learn more? Check us out on Instagram at Moss Marketing Group, on Facebook at Moss Marketing 58, or on our website at mossmarketinggroup.com.